Blocks and Storytime. In this module, we'll be looking at the use of blocks and stories in preschool and young classrooms. So the first thing we need to think about is what are children actually learning while they play with blocks? Well, it's not just a fun experience, although it is that, and that has a lot of value, but they're learning about things like science and math. They're problem solving. How do they make a bridge go from one end to the other? They're counting. How many blocks do you have? How many do you have? What happens if we take this block away? They're learning about gross and fine motor skills. They're learning language skills as they talk and communicate with each other. They're also using their creativity, their imagination, it's boosting their self-esteem and their social emotional growth. So because it's so important, we wanna think about how we're actually going to use the block areas in the classroom. The first thing you need to think about is where are you gonna set up your block area? Your block area should be somewhere that's large enough that children can build and not a high traffic area, because if it's a high traffic area, kids are gonna have their blocks knocked down all the time and it's gonna be miserable. It should also be a little bit away from everyone else because you don't want the blocks to fall and interrupt other children's play as well. Now, looking at this block area, you can see that there's matching going on, that the, usually what we do is we, we print out something that either shows the shape of the block or you can simply get a piece of contact paper and trace around the bottom of the block so children can match where blocks should go. This gives them a sense of independence so they can ma match the block to the area when it's time to clean up. Being responsible before and after blocks is extremely important. Now, of course, this is dependent on the age of the children. It might be difficult for them, for two-year-olds, to put the block back, but block time and cleanup block time should have enough importance that someone should come over and assist so that kids do know how things go back. Also, walking them through the block area as a class and discussing how it will be used beforehand can be very beneficial. Now, how many blocks should your classroom have? And a lot of times people are shocked by how many blocks you need to have. So a two-year-old classroom should have at least 200 blocks, a three-year-old 300 blocks, four-year-old 400 blocks. So it should match the age of the child. Now, a lot of times I hear teachers saying, I'm not putting that really large block in there because they're dangerous. The thing is, the more children are exposed to these type of blocks, the less they're going to be picking it up and using it as weapons. So please don't limit the blocks. Now, some people replace wooden blocks with foam blocks. The problem with this is it doesn't balance and it doesn't have the same effect. These should be wooden blocks with lots of different shapes and enough that children have, don't have to fight over the shapes as well. You should also think about having an area that can be for block expansion, where you might have feathers in it, writing paper, um, little people, whatever it is that can help the play grow further um, so that children aren't just using the block area, but they're really allowing their imaginations to, show, to soar. Now, when children are playing with blocks, they start to move through lots of stages. These stages are really dependent on how much exposure children should have to blocks. So when you're doing playtime in your classroom, which should be at least once a day, they should have access to blocks every single day. Every playtime, the block area should be open. There's no reason to close it. If children are using the blocks inappropriately, that means you need to have another conversation with them. But blocks should not be taken away as a punishment. This is fundamental for children learning in preschool. So stage one is caring and exploring. Children pick it up, they dump the blocks, they explore with the blocks, but they're not really using them for construction yet. Now, while I'm showing you these blocks, you notice these are, these are not the typical wooden blocks. And we're talking about typical wooden blocks that you should have in your classroom. These are smaller, but they're brighter, so you can see them better uh, as we go through this PowerPoint. Um, the next is stage two, where they form rows and stacks. Um, and, and you'll see quite a bit of this, and I always love when they hit this stage. Now, once they get more exposure to blocks, they start to build up they start to bridge space, they start to move into actual formations. So they're not just stacking and creating rows and creating patterns. They're now starting to think about how they can make actualize what they're seeing in their imagination. The next is creating enclosures. And this is usually something stuns that's flat. And they'll have a little animal inside and they'll create a little place for the animal to be inside. They might do it around their bodies. They may do it about their friends' bodies. 
And as they move on, we start to get into the balancing where children are creating different patterns. Their structures uh, are just absolutely wild to watch. And you can see here, there's, there's a symmetry to what they're building as well. Now, it's not always symmetrical and children may play with that, but they are starting to work with the idea of balance and patterns. The next are naming structures, and they start to name structures before or during construction. They may say, I am building a farm, or I'm gonna build a bridge. So they're starting to think about what it is they're creating, or they think about what they created in the after effect. One of the things that you can do as a teacher is when you walk over is to say, that looks really interesting. Do you have any words for that? I like the way that you've used those blocks to create a long shape coming down. Is there a reason you did that? So that we're not asking them to name what it is. We're not trying to push them to stage six. We're allowing them to say what it is they're experiencing and what it is that they're creating or that was created. Sometimes these things happen by accident and that's fine too. Now our last stage is building representational structures. So before they build them, they think about what it's going to be. And then once it's completed, they use it for dramatic play. This really shows when a child's reached stage seven, they've had a lot of exposure to blocks. And that's really what we want them to get to. Now they may get to stage seven and then go right back again to stage one, or they may go to stage four and that's fine. That's part of childhood is going in and out of the stages and doing lots of experimentation. Now, another thing that you saw in this module, uh, we talk about is reading to young children. Now, in, in classrooms, there are two ways that we tend to read to the kids. One is we put them on our lap and it's one on one and we share a story. And what's so wonderful about this is it creates that sense of comfort, of joy. Um, and we have this wonderful connection that starts with books where children experience that feeling of comfort when books are taken out. The next way that we work with children and books in preschool classrooms is through group read-alouds. Now, when we do read-alouds, there's a lot of things you need to think about. One is, can everyone actually see? The teacher in this picture is using a very small book. So she has to make sure that every single child all the way in the corner can see to the other corner. My suggestion is to go back and forth two times before you turn the page. This will eliminate children getting anxious and saying things like, I can't see it, I can't see it. And teachers often say, well, it's coming around, don't worry and it never comes around. And they are absolutely right to be anxious. So making sure that every child has the opportunity to see. Another thing that teachers tend to do is they ask a ridiculous amount of questions. They're asking questions about, have you ever been to the park? Do you like ice cream? The problem with this is, first off, uh, that it brings children out of the story. There needs to be time when we read to kids just to read to kids. If we are using questioning, we should think ahead to about three questions that we want to use. And those questions should be pre-planned based on what it is we want the children to learn. But there should also be times where we are simply reading for children to enjoy it. Studies have shown that this emphasis on literacy and questioning causes children to lose interest in stories. And as they get older, they read less and some don't read at all. So one of our jobs, especially with young children, is to really engage them in the stories. Do the voices, act silly, jump around if you need to, get the children involved.